So now that we've discussed what biodiversity is and how to sample and recognize it, and we've discussed what could be the problems with harming biodiversity, what we're going to talk about in topic 3.4 is how do you go about then conserving biodiversity? So why, why would you go about preserving it? Well, in this course, we've been talking about how the more diversity there is, the healthier the system. So there might be aesthetic reasons. It just looks nice. It's better to look out into a nice forest than it is to look into a brick wall. There's ecological reasons. It preserves habitat and food webs. There's economic reasons. We may need the resources from that particular habitat. There's ethical reasons. Every animal has a right to exist. People who live in those areas have a right to share in the prosperity of it. And there's social reasons. There are, there are groups of people who their culture and so forth is actually part of the biodiversity. Who's involved in conserving biodiversity? Well, there's probably two groups. NGOs, which are non-governmental organizations, those that are not part of the government. Worldwide Wildlife Fund, for example, a like Greenpeace. And then there's IGOs. Those are part of some sort of government or international organization. So international government organizations. They each have their pros and cons. So here's just a quick list of which one works better under which conditions. So as far as media, IGOs tend to work with the media, whereas NGOs tend to like to stage protests. Think about Greenpeace and so forth. Speed. IGOs work very slowly through legislation, whereas NGOs, fast responses. Motivation. One is political. One is definitely idealistic. Public image. IGOs are businesslike, whereas NGOs tend to be confrontational. IGOs tend to be involved in legislation, whereas NGOs tend to be watchdogs to make sure people are not violating legislation. The agenda, IGOs tend to have guidelines, whereas NGOs are very common to lobby for activity and public versus private funding on them. International conventions, so what, what are the forms of legislation that they try to uh, enforce or be watchdogs for? We've already talked about the Montreal Protocol on um, ozone levels. Kyoto and more recently the Paris Agreement is in greenhouse gases. We talked about uh, CITES, which is Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species. These are all big international agreements and they have their pros and cons, obviously. So how would you go ahead then and adopt a strategy to conserve biodiversity? Well, there's, there's two strategies. One is in situ, which is work with things in place and ex situ which is take them outside and bring them somewhere else so in situ would be like simply to surround an area with a fence and say okay well, this is a this is a nature preserve nobody can go in here it's a wilderness area ex situ is we remove animals or plants and put them in arboretums or zoos or seed banks and as you can imagine both of these methods you know have pros and cons to them so let's talk about in situ conservation. Well, these are protected areas. How would we go about designing one? We'd want there to be corridors, connection between the areas so that animals that exist in those wilderness areas don't have to cross a road, for example. Uh, we want a meeting area, uh, an ecotone where different animals within there can come together. We want to have a bit of an edge effect, and that is you don't want the... Um, habitat to be completely homogeneous. You want areas that suddenly change so you can have different conditions. And you want keystone species, that is, species which really hold the area together and maintain the habitat. What are the criteria that we would use to design such a system here? Size, bigger is better because you would then have more richness. Shape, rounder is better, obviously. Maximizes the interior and decreases the edge. We want corridors and we want buffers between them. So let's suppose as I was designing an in situ preserve, this would be better over here. This would be worse over here. You don't want it broken up. You don't want it far away with large buffer areas. 
And these are not connected at all. These are nice and connected, so this would make for a better system over here, any of these, as compared to this over here. Which is best, in situ or ex situ? Well, I suppose it depends on your point of view. There's different factors. In a in situ, you're going to have diseases, whereas, I mean, think about it as a, as a wildlife preserve versus a zoo, for example. So in zoos, we can control the diseases, whereas the cost is very high. Monitoring would be very easy, hard to go out into a wilderness area and monitor things. There's community involvement in a zoo. Breeding, however, is extremely difficult in a zoo, ex situ. Animals need to be in their natural habitat. And you can uh, control that there's no poachers in there. So there, there are pros and cons to it. 